when the desires are shifted from the material to the spiritual, then um, so many of these other smaller desires fall away. Uh, how much, where we live, how much money, what we drive, what we, and so on and so on, what we wear, the watch we have, the phone we have, the, you know, everything, all those things. Um, so, Bhagavad Gita, um, ancient text from, from India, is bringing us, um, speaks about one-pointedness. It is said that we should fix our intelligence on, on just one point, uh, the Supreme, um, to see that everything has a um, divine origin and a divine purpose. And if that's not there in life, yeah, then life becomes shallow. Right? Then we're just playing with toys. Yeah, so many toys. But, you know, it gets boring playing with toys. Not fulfilling. So if you want some deeper meaning, some deeper fulfillment, then we appreciate that everything has a divine origin and a divine purpose. Um, the Supreme. Supreme Lord. So Bhagavad Gita is making that point, that that should be the focus. And the more that becomes the focus, the less, the less everything else begins to matter, the you know, less important. And so then there can be what is called simple living and high thinking. Um, and then it doesn't matter where one is, then one can be in the middle of a complex place like New York. Yeah, obviously, New York is not simple. Whatever New York is, I wouldn't put the label simple on New York. You know, it's many things, but simple wouldn't fit. Um, it's complex. There's so much variety. Now. In fact, the city is, is, is extensive, and there's, this is the place where whatever you desire, you can find it. It's there, whatever it is. Um, but when we focus, and a text like the Bhagavad Gita helps us to focus, then we can um, simplify. Just because we have a goal, one goal, clearly, and everything starts to connect to that. Right? Spiritual life is not some sort of addendum, not something you add on in life, uh, like, like spice, you know, a little spiritual life. Just, I like spiritual things. Not like that, spiritual life means understanding, understanding reality, seeing reality in, in that perspective, everything. So then everything starts to connect then whatever we have is, is used also for that purpose. So this is, uh, is um, how to make things simple. Of course, the question is, do we want to make things simple? Do we want to make it that simple? Say, maybe this is a little too simple for some people. Yeah. Well, yes. Um, like I said, that's because we have so many desires in this world. Um, then simple living is not possible. But by um, just by spending time with people who, who, who have that focus, um, then we also develop such desires. Because whoever we are with, we develop the desires of the people we're with, right? like after a while, catches on. And um, that's why it all begins uh, with um, just spending time with the sages, spending time with saintly personalities who have that spiritual depth and focus. And yeah, uh, you know,
know. Um, in the modern Western world, um, our, for most people, the problem is not starvation. Right? For most people, the problem is is uh, is, is more on the mental plane, right? mentally tormented by so many things, uh, all these desires that are not happening, all the frustration. Mm -hmm. So. Um, by creating that spiritual focus, we, um, life becomes simple. Now, as I said, we begin to um, spend our time with the sages, with the saintly persons. And their business is, uh, they preoccupy themselves with spiritual matters. Um, so, um, the mantra chanting is that it is like creating a deep focus right? and the mantra is um, is carrying so many dimensions in the beginning it's maybe a sound maybe uh, nice music spiritual music whatever but with time uh, we begin to appreciate that the mantra has all um, spiritual potency within it and that means every aspect of it every aspect of it so that means there's no difference between the mantra and and the supreme of course you know you wouldn't and supreme means really everything um, all uh, all energies all forms have their everything has its origin in the supreme mind so by connecting with that mantra, um, we automatically are carried to that spiritual platform. Something like a river, you know, like when you, um, in India, you have these sacred rivers, like the, Gang like the Ganges, and we take our bath in the Ganges. Right? Now, when you go into the Ganges, then on the shore of the Ganges, there's a current. But it's not so strong. It's we have to push ourselves through the water. And when we as we enter deeper and deeper into the water, at one point you don't have to push anymore. The current just grabs you. So Kirtan is also like that. In the beginning it's like we're doing it, we're singing, we're sort of trying to we're part of it and maybe the mind goes here, maybe the mind goes there, maybe it's like uh, um, we kind of fully enter, and but we're trying to do it. Um, it's like we just put our first steps in the river. But as we keep on chanting, it will take us deeper and to the point where there's a current. Um, it's not just a current of music and sound. It's like much deeper. Um, we begin to appreciate if you chant the mantra. And not only is it a good experience, you get the eternal benefit. And you get to appreciate that not only are we getting eternal benefit in terms of good karma and, uh, and, and being relieved from all the bad karma and all these kind of things. No, we're getting eternal benefit. Different dimensions open up. We begin to see like other aspects of life and existence. And we realize that we were wasting our time with Yes, what they say, broken pieces of glass, and he missed out on the diamonds. Mm. So that is the nature of this chanting. It, it carries us, and, uh, and, uh, and we find a greater depth within. Um, then life becomes very simple, because then what do we need in this world? Then basically we become satisfied within, self-satisfied. Well, if you're satisfied within, then whew, life becomes pretty easy uh, for me also. Uh, it changed like that. I'm from, uh, I'm not from New York. I'm from uh, Amsterdam. And uh, Amsterdam is small, but uh, full on at the same time. <laughs> so um, what can I say? It's a uh,
life was was full on. But then there was a time when on a Saturday night I could not uh, not have an early night. Who can have an early night on Saturday? I mean, there was no way I could. You know, the idea would have been too much. These days, I'm quite happy about an early night on Saturday because. <laughs> Early night on Saturday gives me early morning on Sunday. And early morning on Sunday means I've got the peaceful time in the morning to get absorbed in my mantra meditation. Now, what more can you want? That, that's the best. So early Saturday nights is what it's all about. Yes. <laughs> For that matter, it's most nights. Huh. Because early nights bring early mornings, and early mornings are the ideal time for getting absorbed in deeper matters. Yeah. Chanting of mantras. Well, he said speak 20 minutes. I know that was 20 minutes already, but it's getting close, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Uh, I don't know. So I don't know how long you've already been here. Maybe you were already here for a while before I arrived, because I was stuck in traffic. We came from upstate, so, you know. But, um, yeah, maybe some, some response, some, some question, something, would be nice. A challenge, whatever you want. <laughs> Go for it. Just don't throw things. Yeah. Couple, couple questions. So, couple, yeah, yeah. <laughs> how long have you been chanting? Um, actually, um, let me just calculate. About forty-eight years. But the first four years, I was chanting a Ram mantra. What mantra? I chanted the first a mantra dedicated to Ram, Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. Then I shifted to the Hare Krishna Maha mantra. Why did you shift? Because I realized that it, it, it had a greater greater depth. It gave a, um, Ram is is a is is a deity who comes in this world to to show the ideal example of human life. It's like the, the perfect role model uh, in every situation. But um, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra opens up the spiritual world in full. So at one point I began to understand that. Then by being with devotees, I started chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra. Mm. And then you said um, it opens up, you know, the diamonds is how you said it before. Yeah. What what would you like what's the best way you could describe like the, the diamonds that you experienced? Yeah, there's so many levels, obviously many levels beyond uh, what I have experienced. I'm just uh, uh, just a simple man, not nobody great. But even, even someone like me, you know, um, what I what I find is that this uh, this chanting of the mantra, because it is direct mercy, it's, like I say, it's invested with all the uh, the mercy of the Supreme, who is is all benevolent and full of love uh, towards all living beings. So it's full of is suridam sarvadeena. So it's full of um, of mercy. So all that mercy is. Uh, is just touching my life and uh, and then when you that purifies that makes you attached to it then when you start to share that and when you get in the mood of giving and, and just give this this transcendental energy everywhere um, then you become more and more selfless now that's a diamond that's a diamond I am uh, experienced. There are many, many greater 
diamonds that I've heard about, but that I have not uh, experienced. Deep, deep love, you know. I mean, but at least some selflessness is is is, uh, is a great diamond. When we're not self-centered or selfish or like that, it's such a liberation. You know. A world where everyone cares for himself. It's a, it's a hard world. So in that way, Mantra brings diamonds. Yeah. Thank you. Please. You said there was a holy river in India. Um, yeah, a holy river in India. Is the drum connected to the holy river? Is the drum and dance connected to the holy river? Is the drum and dance connected to the holy river? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but naturally, um, you know, bees go for the honey, flies go for the sore, right? So naturally, uh, those who are devotees of the Lord, uh, they will go for holy places, they'll go for holy, holy rivers. So they'll naturally want to be on the banks of such a river. And there, the chanting and dancing will happen. So the chanting and dancing in this form first appeared on the holy banks of the Ganges in Bengal 500 years ago. Uh, of course, first is, it, it appears again and again, but in recent history, first it appeared in West Bengal 500 years ago. And then the whole culture came where of, of chanting with the drums and dancing. And that was a level of, of chanting and dancing which we can match. That was something, because it wasn't just and enthusiasm, that was just pure ecstasy, pure ecstatic love, uh, overflowing. But anyway, that, what's going on here is the echo of that. Uh, we're just really echo. Uh, yeah, so all that chanting. Like on, on, uh, on Saturday, the, uh, the chariots will go down Fifth Avenue. What time is it? 12 to 2. 12 to 2. 12. Huh? 42nd 12, Street. 44th. 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 And 5th uh, Avenue to yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. Okay. 12, well, 44th Street, 5th Avenue, it starts. Right. The chariots. Then you'll see the serious chanting and dancing. Chanters from all over the world are excited. They all flew to New York to be there and be with it. Me too. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna do it. We're gonna let all all breaks loose. Forty yeah. fourth, Fifth Avenue, twelve. We'll be on time because New York police is okay. Move, move, move. <laughs> I see a hand. Yes, hand. Uh, You have an interesting situation. So, as I come here and meet people, my heart opens. But I have the bad habit of opening it up to non-spiritual people on the outside, and I get punished for it. Yeah. How do? And when I get punished for it, it closes off. It makes it hard to open it up when I come back. Mm -hmm. How do I? How do I balance this? How do I deal with it? Yeah. Um. I'm a little bit like you. I also open my heart to people. You know, I'm not very reserved. I, I just, my heart's on my tongue now. I'll tell you anything uh, about my life and just in the open. But the thing is this, if, if we open up to spiritual people, yes, then we may open up to people who will, who will, uh, who we can trust and not, not abuse us. But when we are in the world, um, there are many people who abuse us. The thing is, we open our heart to people. But the question is, what do we want from people? You know, if, if we want many things from, from people, right, 
then we give them an opportunity, then there's an opportunity for them to abuse it. If there's nothing we want, if we only are giving, yeah, if we're only giving, what can it do to us? What can anybody do to us? You know, so, so that's how I don't get, get, I open my heart to everybody, but I don't want anything from that. I just want to give. So in this way, I'm not getting, uh, I'm not getting, uh, hurt or all that. No. Even if they insult me, you know, what can you do, you know? <laughs> Get over it, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. That's all I will say. That actually means that I'm selfish in the way that I'm trying to give my love. Well, you know, maybe, maybe uh, all, all our, who, who can speak of pure love in this world? You know, our love is mixed with personal desire. We all, we give love, but you also want love back. That's the thing. So we're really looking for, okay, you know, I'm not getting it, I'm not getting it. But actually, the love, when you get, connect with love on a higher level, in, the, in a relationship with the Supreme, yeah, then you get that loving propensity satisfied there. Then you don't need to look for love here, love there, love everywhere. Because the love in the world always has these, it's mixed, it's ever pure. It's always mixed with some self-interest. So there you get, sometimes you get kicked in the face. Yeah. Welcome to the Broken Hearts Club. <laughs> yeah. How do I face bad emotions? Bad emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we start somewhere in the middle of ignorance. Right? We grew up as kids. We didn't know what was going on. So many things happened to us and this and that. And now here we are. And... Uh, all these residues of so many experience and a trauma here, a trauma there, this or that, you know, and um, so everyone has maybe some imbalances and some residues in their, problematic residues in their personality. Uh, most people do. So yes, there are maybe some, um, some bad emotions, fear, you know, all kinds of fears, fear of people, fear of people. So all these things, um, you know, it doesn't just go away by magic, you know. Come to this temple and we tap you on the head and it's gone. No, it's not like that. You gotta work through it. You gotta rise above it. It's a growing process to become free from these emotions, but at least begin with a vision that, you know, if the first vision is that we understand that we are not the mind, we're not the body, we're not the mind, the mind is part of the body, and so we're, we're observers, so first let us become observers, and look, what's my mind doing now? Check it out, here's the bad emotion coming up again, look at that. It keeps on doing it. It's not that we are that. We are in it. This is it. This is this is me. This is the whole universe. This bad emotion. No. Be an observer. Because we are not that mind. Mind, thinking, feeling, willing. We're not that. So in this way, we make a beginning to take some distance from that emotion. And you can see, I don't have to feel like this. It's not necessary. It's, it's actually not based on, on, on facts. So that, then we can let go. And when we absorb ourselves at the same time in a spiritual process, like regular chanting of the mantras, then we get, uh, get strength from there to take that position of the observer. And so we can gradually rise above these 
these uh, kind of emotions. But it's a process, not not done in a day. Yes. So, so, there was a noise I couldn't hear. I spoke about? You spoke about the complexities like in like New York City, for instance, and all these guys are yeah. encroaching on the mind. Yeah. Um, how, do, how would you advise like someone like me? I'm not on your experience level, but trying to be able, to, in a long-term view, eventually overcome these desires that are pulling on my senses, for instance. Yeah. How would you recommend a process that I go about. Yeah. Well, the first thing is you see that it's happening, right? We see it happening. You see it's happening to you. I also used to walk around seeing it was happening to me, but not having a full grip on it. And, uh, yeah, so I, I realized that at one point that um, I tried to everywhere. I was just, I was weak, you know. So, um, that's where I realized I need to be with people who are strong, with spiritual people who are deep, who are strong. So I started to search out that kind of an environment that nourished me, and then I could do it. So yeah, if you wonder why I'm sitting here today with this turban on and whatever, you know, first of all, it's, it's, it's cold today. <laughs> That's one reason for the turban. Um, the other is that, um, I, I uh, as I began to spend time with spiritual people, I found that it's more uh, it's a better way of life. Then there I could do it. You know, when I was with them, I was strong. When I was all alone, out there, with my insights and my understanding, I was still weak. That's the problem. So we need to be with with people who are on the spiritual path, but who also see that we can so easily become entrapped by the senses and sense objects, right, that are just bombarding us, then you, uh, by that association, we become strong. Then, together, take up some spiritual process and become strong, and then, then we have inner strength. Forget it, yeah. Don't need all these things. That's the only way to become really free. And otherwise, yeah, even if you take a little bit of this, uh, this spiritual association and energy, yeah, we get inspiration, we get str some strength from that. That's also good. Not everyone's going to be a monk, right? But even even at home, you can, can live a life at home. But by taking some spiritual nourishment that gives us the, the strength to just uh, let these things bounce off. Fill the heart. When the heart's full, uh, like a simple material example, if you feel really good, right? if you feel really happy about something, then you don't care about so many things because you're happy about something. But when you feel not very satisfied, then you're hungry, then you're really in need for something. I need something, you know, something, someone to boost me, give me a boost. You know, so. so that's the principle. Spiritual activity creates fulfillment, satisfaction. Then we don't need all these things. Then we're strong. If the heart's empty, that's when we're weak. Hungry man, hungry eye. I wrote a song long ago, which, uh, you know, in my songwriting days, that these old, old hungry eyes have told me many, many lies. But maybe this one time, I will be satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Despite where I am. The 
Allah sends, I, I miss it. How do I find peace despite where I am? Yeah. yeah. Uh. I feel like, well, if I get out of here, then I'll be happy or whatever. But. Well, I was just upstate, you know. <laughs> it was really peaceful. Uh, grass and uh, nice lawns and and um, just to be out of the city for a couple of days was a bit of a breather, right? So um, the external environment is, is, is influencing us, you know. Only if you are uh, a totally <clears throat> deeply evolved uh, spiritual personality on the topmost level will you be unaffected. And so um, we may... You may be affected by the external environment, but uh, still we anchor ourselves. So not too much, you know, not too much. But yeah, it's like uh, you know. In our current state, we're all people with spiritual interests, and we all have some sense, you know, that there's a, there's a bit of bit more than just. Uh, yeah, the physical dimension and the things around us and the senses and the sense objects there. Yeah. But, um, and the relationship there. Um, but still, so what I, what I started off with, we realize, you know, that people who have too many desires, they are, they'll never be peaceful. Yeah. So you'll be more peaceful if the desires diminish, but it may not be perfect. Because we're we're on the way, we're on the path, yeah. and reach the goal. We're on the path. So on the path, we'll just have the strength to go in the right direction. But there still will be some agitation, yeah. and that's why. Okay, sometimes you just got to get out of here, or whatever the situation is. Go. Sometimes go looking for an inspiring place. <coughs> go on a pilgrimage. Go to a holy place. Go for a holy river. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. Yeah. I also need to do that. I, I need to go on pilgrimages sometimes to rejuvenate. Otherwise, it's a, yeah. Although there's a certain level of peace, but still some things eating on the edge of the consciousness. You know? Some rats are, there are rats on the edge, the edge of the consciousness. I see. All right. I can hear. Your microphone needs to be closer. Closer. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mara was just talking about how the river is kind of like the kirtan and you're on the banks and you kind of have to push away and then at a certain point the flow just takes you so we'll ask Maros to lead another kirtan and this time if everyone could please stand up oh, I, I heard one thing that Maros really likes when people dance so there's a lot of people in here I don't know if it's going to work but at least we can focus our minds and chant the mantra very loud. This will help us get everything that we're doing today, like getting closer to the satisfaction, controlling our desires, um, attaining these spiritual diamonds, so on and so forth. So, thank you very much for coming. Hello. Let's get absorbed. Sides of the room.
After a few days in uh, upstate, I was ready to come back to the city. <laughs> so a little life. Thank you so much. Ramakrishna Maharaj ki.